Hello and welcome everyone to Making Public Health Personal. This podcast is brought to you by the CUNY Graduate School of Public Health and Health Policy in New York City. I'm your host, Delore Mioli Farragon. Thanks for listening. In this episode, you'll learn how to make a difference for marginalized communities in need by exploring proven ways to combat local and global health challenges. Let's start with our first guest, Philip Kroniski, Assistant Professor of Community Health and Social Sciences at CUNY SPH and an Adjunct Assistant Professor at Columbia University's Mailman School of Public Health. Dr. Kroniski uses implementation science to study adolescent health, focusing on digital technology and health inequalities in the U.S. and Sub-Saharan Africa. As the principal investigator of two National Institute for Mental Health grants, we'll discuss his research findings around adolescent capacity to consent to public health research and talk about a pilot program that he spearheaded in which he used mobile phone technology to prevent HIV and related sexual, mental, and substance use problems for youth. We'll also learn how public health communication strategies differ when targeted toward adolescents and the global policy changes and interventions needed to overcome socioeconomic and racial disparities that cause a higher incidence of HIV and mental health symptoms. Phil, thanks for joining me today. A pleasure. Thanks for having me. So what drew you to the field of public health when you're focusing on HIV research in sub-Saharan Africa? So I have a long relationship with the field of public health and sub-Saharan Africa. Growing up as a kid in New York City in the 80s, my godfather, in fact, died of AIDS-related complications. And I also have family connections to South Africa when the epidemic really was leading to lots of loss of life in Southern Africa. That coincided with the time when my family, who had been against the apartheid regime, when apartheid ended and they were allowed to return, and they had been doing work in Southern Africa in the field of public health to fight against AIDS. So it was something that I'd always been interested in and exposed to from a young age through my family and also the city and places I'd lived. So I'm wondering today, despite groundbreaking antiviral treatments, why are adolescents in Africa still affected by HIV? One of the things that I think is hardest and also in some ways motivating and inspiring for me to think about when you think about HIV, we saw similar patterns with COVID and mortality rates and who gets ill. It reflects the the structural systems in place in society in the U.S. and across the world, right? It's the people who, you know, from, from the lowest income communities, it's the people who already are not being provided services that become the most vulnerable. And so HIV really takes advantage of these vulnerabilities in our society or the ways that our society is structured. When we think about young people in sub-Saharan Africa, they tend to have the fewest economic resources. They may have different levels of autonomy. They may need to live with their family. They may not have the socioeconomic resources to make their own choices. And then what continues to create this problem is even though we have these services, they're not targeted towards the needs of adolescents. So the number that always sticks out to me is 1% of biomedical HIV trials include adolescents. We come up with these great biomedical interventions, but then we don't tailor them and we don't make them available or we don't bring them to the groups that may need them most, who are the most vulnerable in our society, like young people or people with unstable housing. And it's the same patterns we see often, slightly different demographics, for example, in the US, but it's a similar problem. We have societal systemic issues that make certain groups vulnerable. And we have to really work hard to make sure that our interventions and these groundbreaking technologies to prevent illness are tailored to groups to meet their needs that are often different than when we think of the general population. So you said that the research studies and the treatments exclude adolescents. Why is that? People who do this work want to do the best work possible within the world of research. For good reason, there are protections of minors. So one of the basic principles, if we think about research ethics, is risks and benefits. And so when we think about young people, for much of the world, depending on the state or the country, there's different regulations. But generally, the age of 18 is when you can make your own decisions involved, for example, with research. There's just extra levels of labor on a researcher's side to include young people. And if they're funded from the National Institute of Health, etc., researchers are often strained on their resources already. And so they may not have the proper support systems in place. So it is also a structural factor. They may feel like they can't do it safely. And it takes, on top of that, extra steps with ethics boards to apply for a waiver of parental permission, for example. 
And it can also raise, like we see in this country, societal debates about at what age does a young person get to make their own choices, right? So I think it's understandable why we have this problem, but that doesn't mean that we can't work to address it and think about it in more complex ways or proactive ways to think about, okay, is it all people under 18 or are there certain, maybe if you're 15 to 17, might you be closer to being able to make your own decisions about participation in research? And so that's what a lot of our recent work has been doing is to be saying like, are there gradients here? What's the difference between a 10 year old's understanding of research risks and benefits versus a 17 year old? There's a lot of differences in the way they live in the world. So maybe we need a more fine grained way of thinking about these different groups. And that's so important because if we just use this broad swath of everyone under 18 has to have parental permission, then we end up making older adolescents vulnerable and not being able to make the services just right for them to help them lead better lives. Absolutely. I think those teens are the ones that need the most information and help when it comes to sexual reproductive health. And if we can't talk to them and reach them and give them the information that they need, it's really troubling. Can you talk about the link between HIV and mental health symptoms? For many people who have acquired HIV, especially young people, this is a major life change for them. We have the tools to address HIV. Historically, before treatment, being diagnosed with HIV was a death sentence. But in the current moment, HIV is really a chronic illness. But it's still a major life change, especially for adolescents and young people who are forming their identities. And now they have this new part of themselves that they're going to be living with for the rest of their lives, potentially. So that can also lead to questions about self-worth and cause stress, which contribute to symptoms of poor mental health. So I think it's a two-sided relationship here. And there's been a real call by the WHO and NIH and other groups to say, you know, we need to think about integrated services, right? And part of the reason for that is that where I work in Uganda, for example, the resources are really stretched in terms of the health resources, but there have been substantial gains in terms of HIV prevention and treatment services, in part thanks to PEPFAR and other U.S. and international programs. And so there are clinics, for example, for sexual reproductive health or HIV prevention and treatment, and those are well positioned to actually serve adolescents in the community. So we can think about using this HIV prevention and treatment in low resource settings, and then to fold in mental health care and treatment where possible. It's challenging, but it does create one potential place where young people may be getting diagnosed with HIV, and then it creates a potential opportunity to provide mental health services there. In my recent study, we've been looking into designing a mobile phone-based intervention that would begin to integrate these services. So we're working with a really fantastic group at Washington at University in St. Louis and Dr. Fred Salmala and his team who have a field site in Uganda and have done extensive work on adolescent well-being for school-age adolescents in rural Uganda. And so we're disseminating our mobile phone-based program through their network of schools. Then we're using that text message system to start linking adolescents with integrated care to maybe even build the initial steps of an integrated care program. And this involves providing information about clinics that do HIV prevention and care. It also involves screening for symptoms of poor mental health, so depression, and anxiety, and then if adolescents are symptomatic, then linking them with telehealth counselors in the region. So this is one potential approach to creating integrated care for young people in what we would call like a resource limited setting. There just aren't that many counselors in Uganda. There's not that many counselors, certainly in the rural regions. So this helps extend those resources using mobile phones. So what are the challenges faced in developing services and interventions for counseling in resource limited areas? One of them that we struggle with in the U.S. as well is there's just more people who need care than there are trained clinicians. This is when we think about like task shifting. Can we have people who maybe don't have the highest level of training but have some training is one approach that people have used. Can we use technology? So a lot of the people who do have this training might be living in the capital city or in urban areas, but a lot of the population lives elsewhere. So can we use mobile phones to link up and provide telehealth? But it's definitely one of the challenges we face globally, and it's going to take time to train people to have these skills. So I, I think this is one of the broader questions for the field and for international work. How do we do this more rapidly and effectively? 
Definitely. So how should sexual reproductive health interventions and public health education and strategies be targeted towards adolescents? I know you're using mobile phones, but what is the difference between targeting adolescents versus adults? You know, you need to think about where adolescents are and where they feel comfortable. If you're thinking about an HIV prevention treatment clinic, that may not be an inviting place for adolescents, especially if it's serving the general community. They may feel questioning, do they belong there? Will people know them there? Being sexually active is stigmatized in adolescents. So we have to think about where we might meet them that could help them feel comfortable, right? And so people have done this through creating like adolescent focus clinics. We know adolescents are in schools. We know other places that they congregate. So going to those places and offering services, or at least offering potential for linking to services, I think is certainly another way. Adolescents are not monolithic. A lot of adolescents may already be out in the workforce in certain parts of the world. And so we need to think about where we can find them, where we're not creating additional stigma or additional stress for them. And we lower the bar, what is expected of them to be able to get these services? How do we make them available to these groups? Where do they spend time? How public do you make something? There's no like one answer per se. When we're thinking about adolescence, age is not the only characteristic, but we can see broad patterns by age. In our past work, we've been required to have parental permission. So it's adolescents who are comfortable or who have a parent guardian available who are able to provide parental permission. And it's often those who are most vulnerable to HIV acquisition or a host of other negative health outcomes who would benefit most from interventions. So our work has started to look at how do we measure adolescent capacity to consent and what are the potential differences in this age group or in this developmental stage of who is able to understand the risks and benefits of a study and make those decisions for themselves and which adolescents might require either a parent guardian or a support staff or somebody to help walk them through more thoughtfully these risks and benefits of a study, for example. In much of the world, adolescents can get HIV prevention treatment or sexual reproductive prevention treatment without parents as young as age 12. But when it comes to research, we can't include them without parental permission. And what our study was showing is that, at least in terms of survey research, that adolescents who are 15 to 17 had comparable capacity to their parent guardians in terms of capacity to consent. It was really 10 to 14-year-olds. The majority actually also showed capacity to consent, but there was a proportion of them who really struggled. This suggests that really we can maybe provide supports for that younger age group, but for the older age group, they likely have the capacity to at least provide consent to low-risk survey research on their own. And then the follow-up study to this is actually, we're looking at a much more complicated trial that would provide different forms of pre-exposure prophylaxis, so PrEP, which prevents HIV infection. We're looking at, would we see these same patterns? Or when we introduce a more complicated study, if we think theoretically about cognitive and developmental theory, it's possible that might be beyond the capacity of 15 to 17 year olds, or will they continue to demonstrate this capacity that's comparable to their parents and guardians? This is so important because ethics committees, researchers really need empirical evidence and we need to support why we should be able to waive parental permission or perhaps why we shouldn't. And this is one of those barriers to tailoring interventions is if we don't include adolescents, we won't know what their needs are in these studies and they'll continue to be left out and vulnerable. And I'm sure not only the capacity to consent, but the situations that they're in is a cultural difference, right? Have you seen a lot of cultural difference? There's definitely cultural differences, broadly speaking, between adolescents in Uganda and the US or in each country. And so one of the ways we're looking to bring this work together is in the later stages, once we have some data and we've analyzed them, we're going to convene a global conference of researchers from Sub-Saharan Africa, the UK, the US for a meeting in Uganda where we'll be able to share our initial findings and get a sense from researchers and ethics boards about how those findings may apply or may not apply to different contexts. There is a balance of flexible international guidelines that could be applied depending on regional beliefs and culture systems. And that's one of these age-old developmental human questions. How do people in different cultures develop cognitively, emotionally? Their executive functioning develops. They're granted autonomy. 
does age differ by country and the cultural norms, but the broad patterns are often similar. So what are the goals and expected outcomes for the international summit in Uganda? What are you hoping to get from that? Our idea is to create an accessible digital toolkit. We write research reports, and it's incredible to see who reads those and when they get noted. But often, that's a very limited, specialized community. So part of this project is to create this digital toolkit that would be accessible to ethics boards, who, for people who aren't that familiar with institutional review boards or other ethics types of ethics boards. They often include experts in the field, but also people from the community or people from different administration, for example, like whether it's a school or government, et cetera. So there are people who have high levels of training and expertise and different life experiences who are involved. So our goal from this project is to create something that's accessible for people across the board with different levels of expertise. And then for the summit, we would be reviewing that with our experts from across the world and thinking about exactly the questions you've raised, which are like, how might this be different in a Ugandan context first? a Kenyan or South African or in the Netherlands or the U.S.? What are the cultural factors? What are the state-level politics? How can we move this to a more international, universal understanding of adolescents' needs and their capacities versus just a regional level? And this is something we struggled with a lot as researchers and grant writers. Do we make this a multi-country study or do we just focus on Uganda? For us, it was a real struggle between what can we actually accomplish with this proposal. But for the long term, I think it really is important to create a coalition of people across countries because there's going to be differences. But I think what's exciting for researchers and academics and also most impactful for the world is to understand what are the differences by country? Can we understand these? Can we make claims more broadly about adolescent development? For us, I think the, the summit would help us refine what we've done in this project, and then to understand how can we start to build a group, or really there is a group of people, but how can we continue this work in an international context? And how do we fold this into like guidelines, whether it's the WHO or in the US or in Sub-Saharan Africa? How do we work together to push this work ahead? What are the big lessons that you take away from your research at this point in your career? For me, it's about how we think about illness as a person is sick or a person is struggling, but you have to step back and think about the broader factors that have created a world where groups of people are vulnerable to this illness. And in this incredible, rapidly developing, super digital world we're living in, who's benefiting from these fantastic technologies? Which groups of people are really being left out or left behind? And how do we, in our conversations and in our work, make sure that the gains made through these technologies, whether they're biomedical or mobile phone based, reach the broadest groups of people. And so just constantly working to make sure that is part of the conversation and that the resources, be they intellectual or biomedical, are meeting the needs of groups of people who may not always have the resources to advocate or to create and tailor interventions themselves, but to include them in that process and make sure their needs are being met. The impacts of equity mean that people don't have the time or resources or training to be able to do the work. How do we best work to include these groups of people when they may have, at the moment, much more pressing needs like unstable housing or food shortages? That's the challenge for us, I think. As we just learned, making a difference for marginalized communities in need of public health interventions is no easy feat. But you might be surprised at how similar local and global challenges and solutions could be. Coming up, we'll be talking to Dr. Nicholas Freudenberg to tell us about a groundbreaking initiative to provide campus and community-based services to our students here in New York City. Stick around. We'll be right back. If you dream of making a difference in the world, a public health degree or certificate can give you the tools to do just that. The City University of New York's Graduate School of Public Health and Health Policy equips public health professionals to advance not only a healthier New York City, but a healthier world for us all. We want you to join us in our mission. Visit sph.cuny.edu to learn more about our programs. No matter where you are in your career, CUNY SPH offers a broad range of degree and certificate programs to not only help you advance in your career, but to have a real impact on the world. Public health professionals are needed now more than ever. 
Join us. Visit sph.cuny.edu to learn more. Our next guest is Dr. Nicholas Freudenberg, Distinguished Professor of Public Health at CUNY SPH and Faculty Director of Healthy CUNY. His research examines the impact of food and social policies on urban food environments and health inequalities, strategies to bring the health, social, and economic benefits of a college education to more students from low-income, Black, Latino, and immigrant communities, and public health approaches to reduce the harmful influences of commercial determinants of health. One of these approaches is CUNY Cares, a new model for helping CUNY students find the campus and community-based essential services they need for healthcare, mental health, food, and housing. Here's Professor Freudenberg to tell us about the work CUNY Cares does and how you, our listeners, can get involved with this program. CUNY Cares, it stands for Comprehensive Access to Resources for Essential Services, is an effort to transform the healthcare and social services for CUNY students in order to better help them overcome the health and social problems that interfere with academic success. And we're currently in the first year of a three-year demonstration project to implement CUNY Cares on the three Bronx CUNY campuses, Bronx Community College, Hustos Community College, and Lehman College. And our hope is by showing that by helping students find help for housing instability, food insecurity, lack of access to healthcare, and getting help for mental health issues that we'll be able to help students to make better academic progress, graduate at higher rates, and complete their degree more quickly. When you and your colleagues were putting together the framework for this program, what was your inspiration? Tell us about the evidence-based strategies behind CUNY Cares. Well, we've certainly looked at the experiences in other colleges and college systems in the United States. We've learned a lot from the California state system which also has a variety of programs to meet students' essential needs. And we've learned from them and we talk with them pretty regularly. We also share our findings with other university systems in other parts of the United States, particularly public universities, community colleges, those serving low-income and urban populations. CUNY is the largest urban public university in the United States. And so we think if we can show that this approach works at CUNY, it'll be relevant to other universities serving urban, low-income students of color. And we think that the CUNY students, because they come from low-income communities, because many are first generation in college, because many come from households living in poverty, and many are immigrants and students of color, face an additional set of challenges to students from more middle-class backgrounds who go to schools used to serving middle-class students. And because our students have grown up in the city and have grown up, many of them in poverty, They've experienced a set of challenges that sometimes make it harder to focus on schoolwork and do well. And we hope by assisting students to address and overcome those problems, we'll be able to give them really the wonderful asset that a college degree provides. You know, I'm a public health researcher, and there's probably nothing that by itself better promotes health, economic success, life success, happiness than a college degree. And CUNY has done an excellent job of providing access to higher education for more than 150 years. But the truth is that only about half of the students who enter CUNY actually graduate. And we think one piece of that is their problems facing food insecurity, lack of access to health care, and housing instability. And so by helping students to overcome these problems, they'll be able to do better in school. We chose the Bronx, the poorest of the 62 counties in New York State, has the highest levels of poverty, the highest health inequalities, and also the highest rates of a variety of health and social problems. And so by showing this can work in the Bronx and by beginning with the people and the communities where the needs are greatest, we think we can make a contribution. But we're starting in the Bronx for another reason as well. I've been doing this work for 15 or 20 years now and have worked pretty regularly with folks at Bronx Community College, Hustos Community College, and Lehman. And those three campuses have a cadre of students, faculty, and staff who are committed 
to improving the outcomes for their students. So we have a group of people who are willing to work in partnership with a group at the School of Public Health and the CUNY Chancellor's Office to make CUNY CARES work. We're currently serving all the students who are enrolled in those three Bronx campuses. But we also have students from around CUNY, including a large group of students from the CUNY School of Public Health who work with us to help implement this program. That's great. Earlier in this episode, we spoke about some global challenges and strategies to help adolescents overcome socioeconomic and racial disparities. How do you hope this local work here in New York City will have an impact in our community? And how can these lessons learned provide a model for initiatives like this around the world? The global relevance is that I think everywhere, and particularly in the global South, public health folks have realized that young people are a huge asset to improving health. They have the passion, the time, the commitment to get involved in bringing about changes in policies and programs, and also in reaching out to their peers. And so I think we've looked to the other models of that in other parts of the world to bring that perspective. And we think there are also programs like that in New York City and in other parts of the United States. And we're trying to learn from them and also to share what we're learning so that other people can pick up on our successes and learn from our shortcomings. What do you see as the future of CUNY Cares? Since its founding in 1847, CUNY has been in the forefront of providing opportunities for higher education to people who are sometimes excluded from other institutions, other colleges and universities. And over the last few decades, CUNY has developed a variety of programs to help students to achieve academic success. And we think CUNY Cares is the current, the 21st century model for CUNY's latest chapter in helping college students, particularly those living in poverty, particularly those who are the first in their families to go to school, to succeed in school and succeed in life. So we think this venture has great promise for CUNY in particular, but for higher education in the United States. To find out more about CUNY Cares and get involved or take advantage of any of these great benefits for students, you can visit the website in our show notes or go to cuny.edu and search for CUNY Cares. Thanks to our guests today, Nicholas Freudenberg and Philip Kroniski. And thank you for listening to Making Public Health Personal, presented by the CUNY Graduate School of Public Health and Health Policy in New York City. You can now share, like, and subscribe to our show anywhere podcasts are heard and on our YouTube channel. To find out more about our school, you can visit sph.cuny.edu or connect with us on social media. I'd like to give a special thanks to our new podcast editor, Nicholas Chiafalo, as well as our amazing marketing team here at CUNY SPH for all their help making this show possible. This is your host, Laura Mioli Farragon, signing off. And while public health has a global impact, that doesn't mean we can't make it personal.